What's cool about our workforce and our model is we can solve a lot of different problems. We can do prenatal care, postpartum care. We can do pediatrics. We can kind of direct our field providers at just about any problem as long as we surround them with the resources that they need, the telehealth infrastructure, the devices that they might need, uh, the, the referral pathways to specialists. And what's so cool about this labor force is... They're very broadly scoped. Between an EMT and a paramedic, you can do an enormous number of procedures and really take care of a patient. And most importantly, this is their natural habitat. Like, this is their office. Our home is their office. Welcome to the Game Changing Women of Healthcare, a podcast featuring exceptional women making an impact in healthcare today. We celebrate our guests' accomplishments, setbacks, and the lessons they've learned throughout their careers. We dig into the many healthcare issues we face today and how these innovative leaders are working to solve them. I'm Meg Escobosa. Join me in conversation with some of the many brilliant, courageous women on the front lines of the future of health. Welcome back to the Game Changing Women of Healthcare. Today on the show, I'm talking to Ina Plum, co-founder and COO of MedArrive, a company leveraging a highly trained network of field providers from emergency medical services to give patients the hands-on care they need at home. Hi, Ina. Welcome to the show. Hi, Meg. Thanks so much. It's really good to be here. Congratulations to you and the MedArrive team for being included in the CB Insights 150 Most Promising Digital Health Startups. Thank you. That was really exciting. I'm not, I'm not surprised, but very honored to be included. So I understand that MedArrive has more than 20,000 highly skilled EMS providers in its national network, and your team provides services across dozens of clinical use cases, including chronic medical condition management, transitional care, readmission prevention, urgent care, vaccinations, and palliative care. I mean, this is an amazing array of services. It feels like a natural in today's virtual telehealth reality. But what made you think to tap into the EMS community in particular, and what problem did you set out to solve? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So when I was working on this idea, I was at Redesign Health. My role there was to essentially ideate and launch companies. And based on theses, ideas we had, and we had a strong belief that care was moving into the home. Um, but how do you do it effect, cost effectively? You know, I looked at a lot of the competitors out there, a lot of the folks that came before us. And one of the biggest challenges I saw was that it's so expensive to bring care into the home. And on top of that, it's just hard to get people excited about it. Hard to find the field provi- the providers that are willing to go into people's homes and get them excited about it. That was just, especially nurse practitioners, RNs, and so on, having somebody leave a setting that they've been trained their entire career to be in and then go somewhere very uncomfortable, another human being, a stranger's home, is, yeah. is hard. Yeah. Um, and I have a background in private equity and finance, so I always like to make sure, like, first and foremost, that the unit economics makes sense. So economically, mm-hmm. this has to make sense. And struggle to find a way to make home care work, or in-home care, rather, until I came across the EMS space. And what's so cool about this labor force is they're very broadly scoped. Um, between an EMT and a paramedic, you can do an enormous number of procedures and really take care of a patient. And most importantly, this is their natural habitat. Like this is their office. Our home is their office. Mm -hmm. They don't mind driving. They don't mind waiting for the next appointment in their car and so on. And most importantly, once they walk into the home, they know how to make you feel comfortable with them, a stranger being there. They know how to, you know, pet the dog and get the dog to stop barking, maybe comfort an upset child and so on. Build that personal relationship and that's so key to, you know, building long lasting care with the patient. So that was, that was the biggest, I'd say, unlock for, for me. We've got this amazing yeah. workforce that's excited to go into the home. And on top of that, from just a structural perspective, they're everywhere in every community. We can provide care in rural communities because there's always an EMT or a paramedic there. Wow. And in the densest, densest urban areas. So it just made sense. How has it been tapping in, like engaging them into your service? And was that a hard sell? I mean, it sounds like maybe not, but I'd love to hear, you know, how did you attract 
the this 20,000 person workforce? Yeah, I'll be honest. It's not that hard of a sell because what we're offering them is the ability to practice at the top of their scope. Mm -hmm. During their day job, they see some of the hardest situations that people come across in their lives. And this is such a nice relief to build a relationship with a patient. You're not just running in, um, you know, saving somebody's life, pulling them out, taking them to the hospital. You build a meaningful, long lasting relationship with the patients. And that's something that a lot of folks in the space crave, not everyone. So there are plenty of paramedics and EMTs that go into the space wanting to, you know, pull people out of burning buildings and, and move on to the next person and so on. That's typically not who we target. We target the folks that either did want to do that early on and now at this point in their career kind of want to build something a little bit more long-term or just generally are interested in more longitudinal care. Mm -hmm. And that's the folks that we target. There's plenty of those folks around. And what's nice is, you know, they're not... They're not burnt out by the healthcare system. We're giving them an opportunity to practice the kind of health care they've always wanted to practice. Mm-hmm. So many of our paramedics will say to us, oh, that patient, I know that patient because in my day job, I take that patient to the hospital all the time. It's so nice to actually be able to help them stop and help them and maybe prevent them from going to the hospital long term. So we've had really good luck in attracting um, folks to our company. That is great because there is such a labor shortage right now in healthcare. So yeah. um, I'm happy to hear that. What um, there's a couple of questions just from a business model perspective. How do you make the unit economics work? I mean, you know, a typical emergency pickup, you know, the ambulance ride is so expensive. So obviously that's not what's being done here. How does it work from that perspective? And, you know, like, are the paramedics like contractors or are they like Uber drivers? What's the story with their relationship to MetaRive? Yeah, it's a great question. So in terms of how we staff folks, we've uh, we have every flavor. We have worked with EMS agencies where we provide them with the routes, the visits, and they provide the labor and the operational infrastructure. Staffing companies that provide the labor, and then I would say a majority of our workforce are some form of W two, um, so either part time, full time, or per diem um, folks. And we really like to titrate the type of employee to the complexity of the use case. So Mm -hmm. in our work with SCAN um, in California, providing vaccines for homebound populations, fairly straightforward. You go into the home, give somebody a COVID vaccine, collect some some kind of key demographic information and move on to the next uh, person. We worked with Falk, one of the largest EMS providers in the country on that. They provide the labor. When we do more longitudinal care, where we need to take care of a person, really move their clinical outcomes meaningfully over a period of time, we like to hire folks directly because we want to give them that lengthy training. We want them to build relationships with the patients and so on. So we like to titrate. We also are very conscious around combining part-time, full-time, and per diem folks in a given geography so that we can have that flexibility where at the field provider level, that's what we call our EMTs and paramedics, there's a lot of consistency in terms of hours and the programs that you do, but you combine all of those different types of labor together and together that pool makes a very, very flexible pool of folks that creates like very flexible labor costs on our end. That sounds really smart. Very thoughtful. We try. (laughs) Can you share an example of how your service or how your business has impacted an EMT's career or, you know, what that experience is like for them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Let's see. We have the former chief of the Houston Fire Department working with us. So somebody with dozens of years of experience. Um, He was semi-retired, looking for a variety of types of work opportunities we came across MetaRive and he he honestly at this point in his career was not expecting to be able to practice healthcare and his specific, you know, expertise in this unique way. And he's been so incredible at building meaningful, deep relationships with the patients. He gets so much joy out of it. He'll tear up when he talks about his patients. And that's that's just one of our providers. And on the other side of that, the impact that we're making on the patient. I'll give you an example. In that same geography, I believe it was in in Houston, maybe Dallas, one of our field providers built a relationship with the care provider of a patient. The care provider talked a ton about how much she missed her dog. On one of his drives, uh, he saw a puppy in a box on the street, abandoned. 
uh, picked up the puppy, dropped it <laughs> off with the family, gave it to the care, uh, caregiver. She called the puppy joy because brings her so much joy. And there's somebody's life changed a little bit. And that's just, obviously, we also make an enormous impact from a healthcare perspective, but of it's course. those personal things that are just so cool. It's so true. It shows the humanity of the, the field providers. That's very, very cool. And, you know, you mentioned even just their experience dealing in a high stress emergency situation and how to keep people calm and how to make people feel at ease. It sounds like that's where that just instinct and sensitivity was another example, you know, demonstrating by picking up the puppy. Yeah. They don't get flustered easily. That's for sure. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you kind of referenced Redesign Health. Would you mind telling us about that? I came across Redesign Health at the health conference. I was really impressed by some of the people representing the organization on panels and just what a great name, first of all. And then what a great vision. I'd love to hear from you who they are and what and what was your relationship to that organization? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I joined as one of the first few partners. Um, I was one, I think the fourth person to join the company. So it was me, Brett, the CEO, Andrew Unger, one of the early co-founders of the team and a few other folks. And the, the, the way it was pitched to me was like, Hey, we've got this like pirate ship of folks that believe that there's a lot of impact to be had in healthcare and that there's a lot to be built, a lot of innovation to be had. And just, we just haven't had kind of the enough intellectual power directed at let's innovate, let's change healthcare. Um, so let's bring together great operators, finance minds, healthcare minds, and and change healthcare, redesign it. It's funny, to, it took us a while to get around to the name redesign. First, we thought it was kind of, you know, a little bit mundane and so on, but like, it's so clear and so yeah. on point as to what it does. It really, it's worked out really, really well. So yeah, so I joined, I think in 2017, as I said, my role there was like to build these companies from the from the ground up. This was my first actually foray into healthcare. So it was an amazing kind of crash course in all things healthcare. And we started with a lot of direct consumer concepts, which was closer to my, my background, and then kind of tipped out our way into more complex value-based, um, fee-for-service, claims-based um, healthcare, which I think really is where most sustainable healthcare businesses need to be. So it's an incredible, incredible learning opportunity for me. And man has redesigned evolved since I joined. So we were these five people just starting good companies in, in a room together. And now they've got these incredible folks on their team and all these resources as a company on the other side of it. We got so much support when it comes from to like legal and recruiting and just guidance and advice. Um, it was a great way to get started because, you know, healthcare is not just SaaS. You can't, you can't right. mess around. It's people's lives at stake, so you have to get it right. Right on. Well, I appreciate that. So exciting to jump in with a fresh, I mean, it sounds like, I know you had a, a different journey before landing in healthcare. Let's hear about how you found your way to redesign. I know you had been in a consumer brand prior. Tell me what it was like to be at Blue Apron and your work prior to that. Sure. Yeah. So I started my career in finance investment banking and then private equity. But I think I, I always had this urge to like start things. I'm, I'm a starter. I'd start clubs in college, high school, whatever. I don't know. I'm an immigrant. I, I was born in the Soviet Union. And so maybe it's that. I don't know. I just have this like <laughs> hunger to do stuff. And I'm not, I don't love joining established stuff. I like building my own. Okay. So <laughs> finance was interesting and gave me, I think, a really solid kind of analytical base I thought it would give me an, an, the ability to have an impact on companies and so on, like sort of, um, but definitely not how I, at the level that I was operating at, you know, as an analyst associate and so on. So decided to jump into like a true operating role at Blue Apron. At the time, nobody had heard of Blue Apron. Um, my parents thought it was crazy. Like you're leaving this great job to go to like yes. a food company. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> um, and so suddenly I went from running numbers and spreadsheets to I got thrown into man- running the supply chain team at Blue Apron as things happen at startups. Yeah. So suddenly I was responsible for like every piece of food that went into a Blue Apron box. 
oh having God. and in managing a team of like 30 people, having literally only managed spreadsheets in the past. Yeah. What, so a, what a shift. Yeah. It was a shift, <laughs> but I like, I was working way harder than I ever had, honestly getting paid way less. And I love like every minute of it. It was so fun to be building, to be solving like these real tangible problems. And I really enjoyed the management component of it too. Um, I found like, I just loved it. I found that was a real driver for me, building great teams and supporting those teams. So this was it for me. Like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life is, is, is build. Yeah. And then that eventually brought me to redesign because it's like a beautiful combination of both thinking as an investor and building. Yes. And it, you know, even though I'm a starter, I think I'm a little bit risk averse. So I was, I was scared to do something on my own, start a company on my own. And so being at redesign helped me kind of tiptoe into being a founder. Um, so it's been, it's been cool. That's awesome. I, that's a really nice way to describe what redesign is because it is not one thing. It is not a venture capital firm. It is not just an accelerator. It is all of those things. It sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) It is. It really is. It's hard to describe in one sentence. Yeah. Jumping from spreadsheets to supply chains, what do you think you, like what part of your brain did you tap into? Like what skills did you find yourself having to use differently than like spreadsheet world versus supply chains and getting things to the right place at the right time? Yeah. I'd say the like planner and organizer and skeptic in me, because to make things run, especially complicated things with Blue Apron, we had like hundreds of different providers and like a box couldn't go out if it was missing a piece of garlic. Like it doesn't matter how big or small the ingredient is. It all had to come together and the box had to go out. Yeah. And so I have this motto that I share with my team sometimes. It's uh, distrust and verify. And that's been really like... (laughs) It served me so well because especially in the <laughs> operations world, if you want to make something happen, you have to have a backup plan on a backup plan on a backup plan. And mm-hmm. if some, some vendor or somebody's telling you that something's going to happen, cool, that's great. But verify that and have a backup plan in case it doesn't. And it's so, you know, it works in healthcare too. It doesn't matter if we're de- right. delivering a complicated service you got to do the same thing. I'd say so (laughs) that, and then Blue Apron and D2C in particular, this obsession with the customer and the quality and the customer experience. And that's been really wonderful because I think that's missing in a lot of parts of healthcare, the obsession with the patient experience. Everything's much more around the providers and the system and care. What about how the patient's feeling and how they feel like the visit's going? And, you know, because if they feel like crap after a visit, they're not going to do what you want them to do. They're not going to yeah. follow the care plan. So I think bringing that to, you know, the B2B world and the healthcare world is also just so powerful. That is so true. Um your distrust and verify is such a brilliant operations <laughs> mindset. Where did your skepticism come from? Oh, I don't know. I think maybe just being <laughs> <laughs> being an immigrant, you know, like I, I just oh, I just no. always have <laughs> I just have this mindset of like, I don't know, I'm I'm always on the verge of maybe failing or maybe succeeding. And just this, uh, you know, there's a little bit of being driven by fear, I think, Mm -hmm. um, as well as kind of excitement about what you're doing. And in operations, it does serve you you well. Yeah. Tell me about coming to the U.S. How old were you? What was that experience like? Sure. Yeah. So I was a year old when my family left the Soviet Union as part of the um, kind of migration of Jews out of the Soviet Union. They were released, I guess, um, uh, through like, I think, Reagan's um, diplomatic efforts and so on. Um, So the only place you could really go was Israel. So that's where my family went. We spent the first eight years of my life in Israel. um, And then my grandparents had come over to the U.S. before that. And so we went to all kind of bring the family together. And so around third grade was when I um, came to the States speaking no English, reading it, but that's not speaking it. So that was, uh, that was, that was, that was interesting. Uh, Like being in third grade, not knowing anything that's going on. I remember I was like reading a piece of paper, like a, like a, like a homework assignment or something. And it said, uh, or, or assignment in class, go like, find what you need from the table and what they meant was like the table in the, on the sheet. And I like oh. walked around the room looking for a table <laughs> <laughs> where this answer is going to be. 
Oh my so, gosh. But when you're a kid, it all like you learn really fast. I'm really interested in and and the Krinsky company. Our work is in healthcare innovation, and we are interested in helping to usher in meaningful change and improvements to health, the health industry. And where do you think the future is in virtual care, telehealth, care at home? Where do you think the opportunity is in that space? And how do you think it's going to change? Yeah, this is such a an exciting and honestly fun time to be in healthcare because there, there is so much changing and there's so much energy both from kind of legacy things that have been happening, but just COVID in particular, I think has infused so much energy into the space. Yeah. I would say a few things, value-based care, value-based care is coming no matter what, you know, CMS has said that they want every single Medicare beneficiary to be in a value-based care structure by 2030, like in healthcare, eight years from now or seven years from now is like no time. That's exactly rocket speed. <laughs> so that's really cool that that's happening. And that's why companies like Medrive can, can exist because we look at a person's care holistically and we fit in there. You know, it would be hard for us to survive on a pure fee-for-service world. And I don't think mm-hmm. it's the right way to take care of a patient. So that's one thing. Yeah. Two, there's so much more momentum around care in non-traditional settings. You know, not every, I think we finally realized that not every patient can be served every single time that they need care in a clinic. And COVID has made that clear. There's so much, there's an explosion in, in telemedicine yeah. during COVID. I think like 60% of something encounters happened over telemedicine. It's shrunk down, but still that mindset has changed. Right. We're all able to yeah. do it now and we've accepted we are. it. Yeah. Exactly. And I think we're figuring out kind of how to adjust and like what the right balance is, where telemed's great, where it doesn't work. But like a stay in a hospital, a single day can cost between three and four thousand dollars. Yeah. Some of those stays can happen at home. And that's why you see a lot of really exciting companies out there bringing hospital into the home. And on and that's being helped by all this development in technology, right? Like momentum around remote patient monitoring devices, um, reimbursement pathways for that. So you can do a lot in a non-clinical setting. So that's Mm -hmm. huge. And then I'd say the last thing is we're starting to look at a patient holistically. So it's not just about the clinical pathway. Cool, that's great. But if a kidney patient can't get to dialysis because they can't afford the ride there. Right. They're they're not going to manage their dia- their their kidney disease. Right. Um and so there's so you know what we call social determinants of health factors that you have to consider holistically as part of a patient's care and going back to the non-traditional settings it's so much easier to have those conversations and also pick up on those factors when you're in a patient's home. We can see if a patient doesn't have the right walker in in their home for for their needs. We had a patient who was 600 pounds and had a walker made for, you know, a regular sized person. So you can get out of the house. Like little things like that you'd never figure out outside the home. You mentioned you enjoy managing teams. Tell me about that. What do you love about it? What have you learned about managing teams? Mm. I love seeing that I've empowered somebody to do something and maybe something that they didn't think they could do before. I I just, I get such joy seeing my team thrive and be independent. And, you know, what's cool about startups is you start out doing everything yourself and literally wearing 20 hats. And then as you build a team, you give up those hats and then you, if you can, if you can empower your team and surround them with the support and infrastructure that they need, they'll go and wear those hats and do that job so much better than you could have ever done. And so what you end up building is so yeah. much bigger than the sum of its parts. And I just find that to be so freaking satisfying and exciting. Yeah. And on top of that, just the like building like meaningful, deep relationships with people. That's honestly what gets me out of bed in the morning um, and excited. So it's it's been a joy. That's really cool. What um, in your experience hiring people have there been any misses or and you don't have to name names, but you know have you had any sort of misses? Oops, we didn't see that was not a fit or vice versa. You know, how do you know when you've got the right person in front of you? It's hard. I don't know. I have to. I I can't say that I figured out 
hiring. I mean, we must be doing something right because we've built a pretty darn good team at MetaRive. Yeah. But the interview process, it, there's there's room for bias. There's room for, you know, jumping to conclusions um, and so on. So I, I would honestly say that I don't think there is a great robust way to test for somebody for, for somebody's fit with a company through the interview process. I think it's a signal, but it's a weak signal and you kind of have to use a combination of factors. You just, you have to look at their past experience, how, how they present themselves in the interview. And then of course the conversations themselves. But I mean, the one thing that we do with every single candidate that we bring on is have them do a case study and we make that case study as close to real life as possible. Um, so literally a problem that we're working through at MetaRive today. And we ask them to, to approach it as like, how would they solve it? Because then we get to see how they think and literally how they would be a, you know, a team member with us. And that's been really good. I'd say the the times that we've made misses is maybe when we've rushed and skipped that step. So that's definitely been, um, been one key area of focus for us. What would you say your, you know, next biggest obstacle that you're trying to overcome for the business? Mm, um, there've been a lot of conversations about this lately at MetaRive. We are at I think one of the most exciting and most interesting times in a startup's life where we're at an inflection point. And so, you know, we've been in somewhere between seed and series A stage and have been preparing for this growth. And we are literally a month away from starting a journey of like seven X plus growth. Wow. And that, and it's, so things get real here and scary and exciting and so that's, that's the biggest thing that we're working through right now is like, oh my gosh, how do we make this work with the resources that we have today, um, yeah. the people we have today, and literally reinventing our business over the next six to eight months. I have no doubt that we are set up to do that and set up for success and we have the right folks to do it with. Um, but it's hard, but it's also what makes this so much fun. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's true. This is sort of crossing the chasm. Mm-hmm. I imagine that the investors you have are great partners in enabling this and can help you with different resources, et cetera. Are there any words of wisdom that you've heard that you can share about how do you navigate this time, this growth period? Um, um, We do have wonderful investors. I have so just so much gratitude and appreciation for just how collaborative they are. When you're raising money, sometimes you might think like, you know, money's money, right? So it doesn't matter. It so matters who you have around the table problem solving along with you and supporting you and so yeah. on. I think it's not losing sight of the bigger picture, right? It's yes, we have to grow really fast, but we also need to not run out of money. And when, yes, we want to have yeah. all the revenue in the world, but we also re- want to have really good margins. Um, so it's that constant balance. And I think our investors have been really good at reminding us of just all of the things that we have to balance at one time. Mm-hmm. Um, because there is there is a tendency when you're in the he- heat of the moment to focus on one thing and optimize for just that one thing. Um, but to build a healthy business, you have to kind of optimize across a variety of yes. factors. And that's the only way you're going to get to sustainability. Mm-hmm. We are really interested in women founders and executives and the experience you have raising funds. And we know that there's a serious gap between what women founding uh, entrepreneurs get in terms of their investments, venture capital investment versus male founders. I'm curious what your experience was like. Can you speak to that journey and whether you also faced obstacles in raising funds? And do you have any advice for the next woman founder seeking funds? Um, yeah, really, really good question. Um, I'd say I've definitely felt obstacles throughout my career in getting here. Um, finance, it's like, I don't know, some atrocious percentage of folks or of people are women. I was the first woman ever hired into the private equity group that I was a part of and so on. And, you know, you definitely, it's true. Like you have to work 10 times harder and be that much better to, to, to get ahead and so on. But I think, you know, now at MetaRive, I've been so lucky being where I am today and being surrounded by the folks that I'm surrounded by. My co-founder, Dan, is 
so supportive. We have a real genuine partnership. We complement each other's skill sets and have, I think, so much just deep respect for each other. And I could never do what he does. And I, you know, I, I think I, I do my, my part really, really well as well. We built a really good business together and we built a really good team. So honestly, we have not had, I'd say, trouble um, fundraising and so on. And I feel lucky because I know I know women who have had much more trouble and so on in the past, but I'd like to think we're starting to turn a corner on that front. Um, but I would say like, we have to keep supporting each other. Like anytime yeah. a female health in the healthcare space reaches out to me, who wants, who's a leader or whatever, wants to be a leader, I am so excited to help lift her up and we just have to do that. Yes, totally agree. And I think that's what investors are looking for too. They're really investing in the team. I mean, of course the concept, but the concept can shift as the conditions change, but the team is really crucial to executing. Um, so that's a great endorsement. I wonder if your experience in finance gave you a leg up in any way, or maybe you were just able to anticipate their questions and what they needed to see in your business model and your business case for the vision. Tell me about that perspective. Yeah. I mean, I think coming from private equity into startups, I have to say it was a little bit of a shock of like, we we like we're okay with what kind of unit economics in the startup world? <laughs> like, how long yeah. is it okay to not make money? So um, coming into Metarive, I had a slightly different mentality where I want to have really strong unit economics. I want to be on a on a pathway to get to be cash flow positive sooner rather than later, and so on. And I think that served us really, really well because we end up building a, a much healthier business that way. So I do feel like that's been a real edge, um, especially in a world with very high interest rates, right? You got to get to cash flow positive sooner because yeah. money's more expensive. Yeah. So I think that's been a real asset. And on and just like being able to get in and build a model by myself, run the analytics, do something in the back of my, my head. I will say running supply chain at Blue Apron is, has also been incredibly helpful because you're constantly doing math in your head. I've never been better at mental math than I was <laughs> at Blue Apron, um, adding up invoices and like figuring out how many pallets of cheese I needed to order. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really nice to be able to do that on the fly when you're on the phone with an investor or something like that. <laughs> okay. What was the most, I was going to ask you about like your favorite recipe from Blue Apron or the most cost effective, but best tasting Blue Apron recipe <laughs> <laughs> from the supply chain perspective? Um, let's see. I loved our pretzel burgers because oh. it's ground meat. So that's mm-hmm. that's nice and yeah. cheap, right? Yep. Um, but man, that combination of mustard and we had an incredible vendor for pretzel buns. And then they would add, the chefs would add hops. So we bought dried hops into the mustard cream, I guess, that you put on the burger and you do a quick pickle with onions. So again, super cheap. Yeah. Um, and it was so freaking delicious. I think it was one of the only recipes we, we repeated a few times because um, <laughs> it was so popular. The secret sauce, the hops in the mustard. <laughs> the okay. The secret's out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, chefs. <laughs> Do you have any mentees and do you have any mentors that have guided you in your career? Yeah. Um, I appreciate that question a lot. I do. I do. And I do think I've been good throughout my career at kind of gathering um, a cohort of mentors around me. And I think it's come from just a really natural desire to learn from people who know more than I do. You know, my goal when I talk to a mentor or like look for a mentor is like, I want to walk out of a conversation with a mentor thinking, man, I want to be that person when I grow up. And yeah. that, that, that's the bar. And I found some really amazing people and I always want to build like a genuine, genuine relationship with them. And yes, like, you know, you mentioned this earlier, like as an immigrant, as a startup person, I always believe that like, I can do something on my own. I will figure it out. I'll overcome any challenge, yeah. but I'm, I'm not kidding myself. Like, I don't know how to do a lot of the stuff. Most of the stuff, there's people right. who have done it before and know better and so on. 
And so like my first instinct is always like reach out to people, get advice, get guidance. Yeah. And we've done that at MetaEye from day one. We've had some really amazing mentors and advisors from day one. And like, look, we've made plenty of mistakes too, but I think it's helped us avoid pitfalls and um, missteps and so on. So it's worked really, really well. And on the mentee side, I kind of try to do the same for folks who reach out to me and so on. It's, I'd say I'm just starting on that journey in my career, but it's so, it's so cool and it's so exciting. Um, so it's been, it's been really fun. You're right in the middle of a huge change for your business, but are there other problems in healthcare that you could see yourself solving that you want to see solved? Maybe there's some entrepreneurs out there noodling ideas and you're going to throw out a big problem that needs to be solved. Good question. I mean, I definitely am heads down focused on MetaRive and And I mean this when I say what's cool about our workforce and our model is we can solve a lot of different problems. Like we can do prenatal care, postpartum care. We can do pediatrics. So we can kind of direct our field providers at just about any problem, as long as we surround them with the resources that they need. Yeah. Um, You know, the telehealth infrastructure, the devices that they might need, uh, the, the referral pathways to whoever, specialists. So that's what I love about MetaRev, and I think it can solve a lot of these problems in our way here. But, you know, I think I think women's care is huge, especially when it comes to the Medicaid populations that we serve primarily at MetaRev, because, you know, NICU costs all are one of the biggest costs for Medicaid plans and, uh, and providers. And all of that, so much of it is avoidable with good quality prenatal care. And there's such challenges with access to care in Medicaid populations. So that's definitely something I'm pretty passionate about. That's awesome. I think 50% of the babies born in the U.S. are born as Medicaid members. Yeah, something like that. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and and a much bigger percentage of those babies end up in the NICU when they, when they didn't need to be there. So addressing that prenatal care need yeah. and then avoiding the NICU. That's so fantastic. You guys are going to have world domination very soon. (laughs) That's the plan. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, Ina, you mentioned your grandparents and how their situation during COVID-19, how that, the pandemic, how that influenced your work with MetaRive. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Yeah. So I was working on the idea that would become MetaRive in early 2020, like right as the pandemic was breaking out. My grandparents are very, very dear to me. They they practically raised me along with my mom. Um, I look up to them and cherish them. And when the pandemic broke out, there I just had so much fear about them. I mean, there's they have access to care, you know, they 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 have Medicare and so on, but I just wanted to put them in a box, in a safe box and have them never leave their home and just stay safe, which is not realistic. And especially at their age, they need care. And so why not bring the care to them? Like this just felt like so right. The, The unit economics were great. Intellectually, this was really interesting, but I was working on a bunch of other ideas. I was looking at veterinary ideas and so on, but like this just like pulled me towards the idea because I felt like I could make a difference for people that I can relate with, that I love dearly and, and change how they experience healthcare. So that was, I think, a big kind of unconscious or semi-conscious motivator for, for me and MetaRive. That makes so much sense. And what a strange moment to find yourself in having developed or starting to develop this concept and then to see the world shift to care at home or, or needing to stay home, therefore yeah. requiring the shift to care at home. So incredible timing. It's almost, you know, unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. And people's mindsets changing as a result of COVID being more open to care in different settings and in their homes, you know, like it's a little scary to let a stranger into your home, um, especially during a pandemic, but it's most likely less scary than going into a clinic with dozens of other people. So true. Well, um, Ina, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. I am just really inspired by your your drive to make this business happen. And um, I'm excited to see what you guys do with MetaRive. It makes a lot of sense and we wish you the very best. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Really appreciate it. Thanks 
for joining us for the Game Changing Women of Healthcare, a production of the Krinsky Company. Today's episode was produced by Calvin Marty, Chelsea Ho, Wendy Nielsen, and me, Meg Escobosa. This podcast is engineered, edited, mixed, and scored by Calvin Marty. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. It really does make a difference. And share the show with your friends and colleagues. If you have any questions, comments, or guest suggestions, please email me at meg at And you can visit us on the web at thekrinskyco.com. 